Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome to the first lecture of the A Action Lunchtime Lecture Series. Um, I mean, most of he the people here know that A Action is a student led project committed to bringing about the necessary pedagogical and cultural shift in architectural education in order to effectively work towards climate justice as a collective. Um, across the upcoming weeks and months, we will host a series of lectures and seminars throughout the school, calling attention to the complexities of the current crisis. These Wednesday lunchtime lectures will be addressing different topics within the realm of the climate crisis. Presentations such as today by Javier, followed by discussions, will provoke reflection as to how we should respond to a changing global climate at the AA and in architectural practice in general. I'm really excited that I'm sitting here with Javier. Uh, he's, as you all know, the program head of ETS. Um, he's taught at the AA since 1978, as well as other schools in the UK and abroad, and he's also a practicing architect, and his interests are innovation and invention in the process of the architectural project, reticulated and folding structures, and reinforced ceramics. ETS is a course that positions itself at the core of revising architectural pedagogy in the face of the changing climate at the AA. His presentation will focus on what we as architects should do from now on. The time for action has come. All of us living on this earth must contribute as best as we can to looking after it, but as architects and designers, engineers and facilitators, our contribution is a very direct one. For our contribution to be positive and decisive, there has to be a radical and profound change in the way we approach design. We are no better than our forefathers. It's clear that up to now, we've been designing in a manner that has often been irresponsible. From now on is, a, is about drawing a line. Up to now, we've done it this way. From now on, we're going to design in a radically different way. Therefore, it's about the knowledge and the discernment needed to get it right this time. However, better knowledge of the materials is not enough. Even to fit in with the ways of nature is good, but not good enough. We are nature, we're the most rational part of nature. And the radical change that is needed from now comes from this awareness. So the talk from now on is a talk that will provide us with a new perspective. So over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we always start with thank you, but I think this time is a bit uh, uh, is different because it is true. I've been teaching since 1978, but I was here a student before that. Uh, two wonderful years in the diploma school, and um, and so I've seen lots and lots of um, students' movements and initiatives and that sort of thing. But this time, I think the action is different. And that's why I think that I'm doubly happy to be here talking. Right? I had thought of doing that, and that's how it came about. I told manager, and she told me, well, A action is, it said, done. So here we are. So the, um, let's put a bit of context onto these things. So you've summarized exactly what I'm going to be covering now. So to put the, um, this talk in, in, in context, I think that you have two radical approaches. One is make yourself heard, you know, shouting, um, demonstrating, and doing that sort of thing. And then the other one is that uh, the skills we've got as designers are, and architects and facilitators uh, are very, very important to put this thing right. Um, so yes, we the, the idea of the talk is up to now we've done it this way and it's obvious that we've got it wrong. Now we're going to do it in a different way. So um, in a way, one way is shouting, the other one is um, what knowledge we need to acquire during this um, period that we're here in order to be able to um, give a positive answer, a positive contrib contribution to this, to this problem, right? So um, the kind of, um, so the second context is this kind of knowledge. What kind of knowledge is that we're looking for? Well, I think it's quite important to, to realize that um, we are out there in the field, uh, therefore we have a very broad knowledge to identify what the problems are, and then a very specific knowledge, because we'll, what we need to do is to be discerning. And that is a very difficult um, quality to achieve, and that's what our, our training should be about. Uh, if it is not, it's something that we have to make up individually. Right? 
So uh, at the moment, for example, in the office, I'm looking at uh, what you might call a typical 1960s building that we are going to refurbish and we're going to be working on it. And uh, it's amazing, but you know, you wouldn't think um, it possible, but the roof, uh, the covering, you know, the elastomeric uh, felt that he's got, um, is sitting directly on top of the roof slab. There's no insulation. The walls are um, cavity brickwork, but not no, nothing in the cavities, empty cavity, right? So it, you say, well, how did they get it wrong? You know, had this wrong anyway. Well, this is something that is, they were not, and we are not better than them. But you know, we tend to get quite distracted with the things that are going on and the things that interest us at, at that moment. And we fall into, into the, or we can fall into the, the uh, mistake of forgetting some things that are essential, right? So um, that is the context of what I'm going to be talking. But I'd like to also set the context in, with, in which we live, right? Particularly in Britain. I foresee, well, I see it already, that we are going to enter into a, uh, a world of checklists. You know, I don't have anything against checklists, but when I get into a, an aeroplane and the door of the cabin is open and the pilot and co-pilot are actually checking something and going through a checklist, it gives me a very good feeling. Yeah? But um, this is different, you know. I think that what we have here is that um, the lack of leadership means that countries, and particularly this one, is actually being pushed from behind and not from the front, okay? And um, therefore, everybody's covering the backside. And therefore, everybody is actually making sure that I don't get caught or I don't get into trouble. And then, you know, the, the after the war inbuilt system of the, of the most uh, uh, of the civil service is a checklist. And this is going to be the thing, the world in which you're going to be moving on, right? And um, I think that if there are no leaders, then you and I have to, to be leaders, right? What has happened is it's is worse. It's just that we live in a, in a world which is very much this kind of thing, rubber stamping things, right? At the moment, there's already a move um, which makes our discerning more difficult of actually calling things sustainable. It's as simple as that. You remove one, you put the other, and you do exactly the same thing you've done before. So I think that what I'd like to, to, to discuss today is, on one hand, what kind of uh, knowledge we need, that discernment, because discernment, is, I think, is the knowledge of the leader. Okay, uh, looks at situations and chooses this way, that way, because of, and then this is what we need. We need to have a, a whole uh, knowledge of the broader spectrum and the very specific one, because this is what we're designing. Okay, so I've called this um, uh, from now on, because we're not going to put it right by just simply doing what we were doing before. Um, and to background, I'm going to borrow something. It's, philosophically, this is going to get me into trouble with Irene among, amongst others. But I, it's, it's nice. He's going to laugh at this. But basically, what, um, what I'm looking at is that we have been uh, designing from time immemorial, you know, on this business of matter and form. So from Aristotle onwards, um, you know, we see the, the world around us as matter and form. And we have been transforming, and in fact, designing has been a lot of that, you know, transforming, changing the form. Um, so um, we can actually make a, a plow, a table, a stool, a, a bed, a column, a truss, all sorts of things, you know, by just, we are actually changing the form. So what I would like to do today is to, um, is to move on from that and um, really look at what happens if we look at our uh, activity, not just as a transformation, but as a transmaterialization. That is to say, in our mind, this has always been done from time immemorial, you know, as a, uh, in this material, right? Is this the best material? Is this the, in fact, in Spanish we have the word idoneo, which is very difficult to translate into English. And um, I don't know, if you have a, those of you who are bilingual, if you have a word for it, I'm looking for it. 
is a sort of the perfect, um, Idonia is, is the perfect choice, you know, it's most suitable, you know, very, very strong sort of word. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, try and explain this material, transmaterialization with something that happened to me, right? So there was a, a, a friend of mine who had been forever choosing rimless spectacles like this. Uh, I knew very well why, you know, he was just not prepared to um, take a design decision. What is what I need in my face, you know? Um, so perhaps he said, well, it's bad enough as it is, and just let's, let's do something invisible, right? Until the day came when someone actually offered him the possibility of having a wooden frame, right? And then he said, well, this is fantastic. I was overjoyed. What was happening, he was relinquishing the job of making a design decision and leaving it to the material to tell, to tell him how this should be, right? And uh, so he was very happy about it, and uh, he showed me the, the, the spectacles, and uh, I, I have to say they were a wonderful piece of work. What I noticed in him um, is that not only had he relinquished that, but the, his spectacles have changed from being a prosthetic, something needed to make him see well, into a facial ornament, a jewel. See, you know? So these spectacles for this person that actually, and the way he was looking after and keeping them clean and all that is you know, very different from the previous set of spectacles, right? When he handed them over to me, um, by the way, I don't know whether, you know, these spectacles, 1650s, 1650s, right, more or less, uh, I don't know whether, whether it's a, a pont you know, kind of the whole on the thing, I don't know whether they were um, made of wood or not, I don't know what they were doing at that time, but anyway, when I got those, I never thought of putting them on, on uh, but I started looking at them as a piece of artwork, certainly craftsmanship, and certainly a piece of design. So, um, mostly they're made of wood and metal. And what has happened here is, of course, the client wants this kind of wood because he or she likes this kind of wood. Immediately, the craftsman says, right, well, that's no good, but if I combine it with other woods, then I make it strong enough for most of it. Uh, you can see the parallel on what I'm saying here. So, sure enough, this is a type of glue lamb, a, a type of CLT, you know, it's just putting together different kinds of wood in order to achieve the, the, the result. Where the wood couldn't work, couldn't go beyond and do the job, he strengthened the work. In fact, in the, you can see there in the bridge, there's a tiny line there. Um, that goes from inside to outside, is complete there. And that is um, gold-plated silver, in this case. There's others that are gold-plated um, uh, alloys. But basically, is putting there a reinforcement. Wood couldn't do this, it would break here, uh, therefore, it's got to strengthen with something. But that's just a straightforward strengthening of it. What happens in other parts, you know, like the hinge of the, of the whatever they call these things, sides, um, is a different thing altogether. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized that this was a real transmaterialization in the sense that the metal was taking the shape of the wood. It was actually befriending the wood in actually going there and behaving as the other half of this joint. So you would have expected there a, a, a timber joint, a classical timber joint, and there's where the wood is actually remaining as it is, but this other companion is actually the one that... that so there was a real trans... Uh, materialization there. So what I want to do, and I think that this example um, sort of, I don't know, excuses me to, to, uh, to actually talk about um, this idea that up to now we have actually um, done things in a particular way. Uh, it's time to actually, on the one hand, check you know, the ideal use of that, and really get on with designing uh, in the appropriate material uh, where that comes in. So, I mean, in this country, um, 
our forefathers made a real indent into elm forests because they were using elm trees as pipes to bring water to the various uh, to the various towns and cities. Yeah, so right, that's what they had, but. In other countries, in France, for example, at this particular time, they weren't doing that. They were already using vitrified clay. And the joints were very, very advanced, something that it was more or less the joints. Until we came to head sleeve and that sort of joint, compression joint, that's what we're using in this country and the rest of Europe. So what's that, was that the right choice? Should we have been looking for other materials in doing this very necessary infrastructure of actually bringing water to... I mean, Oxford depleted most of the near, nearby forests of elms, it just, you know. So, is that the right action? So, with this, I'd like to go very briefly through some materials, not to speak about this, so this is not going to be a TS lecture. What it's going to be is in what way we can look at things in, a diff in this different manner, yeah? So as to be able to design, I hope, more rationally and more responsibly, okay? So, um, I've taken this example because this is where the engineer taught the architect a very, very interesting lesson, right? We've all had this um, desire of, you know, I mean, this is, another version of Farnsworth, right? So it's just opening the whole thing. The only thing is in here, it's all supported by this one T-beam from one end to the other. And you can see that structurally works very well because the stiffness of one is actually have, have been helped by the other. So rationally, it works extremely well. And you can see that, well, there's that tendency of getting it all beautifully clean and beautifully perfect, right? We all feel that, right? And yeah, the concept couldn't be clearer. Structurally speaking, you can use the two supports in the middle to get that big beam from one end to the other, and that's it. That, glass, and go home, right? And, um, well, it's attractive, it's, it's there, right? Well, the engineer I taught him a lesson, because you can see here that he's actually reduced it to what? To roughly 300 millimeters? And how many of you will have heard in the structure lessons that you got 25 cover for the reinforcement so that the reinforcement doesn't uh, get wet, doesn't oxidize, doesn't rust, and doesn't split, right? So 300 plus the reinforcement, so you get two lines of reinforcement, another 300, perfect. You can have three reinforcement bars in that, and a nice cage in that, perfect. But this is what the engineer said to the architect. He said, look, I'll give you what you want, but in a more responsible way. And only by a degree, right? The important thing is you can see how it works very, very, very well, you know, uh, the two things are actually matching each other. But I dare say that um, Farnsworth has got, I've compared it to him, but he has ownership of everything else around. So you can change that night, you can do anything you want in your house without being overseen, overlooked. Here, um, the moment the, the next plot is, uh, is built, what's he going to do? <laughs> right? So I think the engineer was right. And one of these days, you know, the next person goes and is going to change everything. This reminds me of, um, I'll talk to you later, because I don't know if this is true. Um, I, I've seen it in, a, in somebody's um, uh, thesis, PhD thesis, but apparently uh, Adolf Loss had a letter from a client saying, uh, roughly, um, all our friends are actually demolishing their houses and building new ones because their houses are out of date and out of fashion, whereas ours is still as good as it was at the beginning and we love it and we don't want to change. So here's, you know, the, what we paid you last time, but unfortunately 25 years depreciation, etc., etc. Uh, it's believed that Neutra had this, this uh, letter uh, in his possession and I don't know what it is now. But obviously, one way of looking at, um, at uh, uh, sustainability is to do things very, very well. So you don't, but this one, I think, that is true. Um, very, very clearly, um, this will be dismantled. The interesting thing about this structure, and I leave it now, is that they're all standard sections. And except with a with uh, very top rim, they're all bolted. So it's going to be very, very easy to reuse this structure somewhere else. Therefore, I mean, the material isn't, you know, that I think is also a comment on demolition. Do we demolish? Do we not? And I think that we have to be very clear now and understand 
what uh, uh, we're looking at as, as a demolition. All right, so with this then, I propose that um, from now on, we're going to be questioning the material, and then really, um, we, we really got to go to the drone board very often, because we're not going to do it the way it's been done so far. So we have to look at it in a, in a totally different way. So the train of thought, more or less, is to see step one, the procure, procurement of the materials. So. Um, it's very easy to think, you know, well, I bought these carrots, you know, I've ripped the thing, but someone obviously has washed them, someone has cut them, something. so the whole process of bringing the food to the table is not very different from bringing materials to site, even to installation. And whether it's actually done in situ or elsewhere, off-site, there's a lot of work to bring those things there. We really need to know the process. We really need to know the pros and cons of the extraction and the effect on it. I remember a deep pour project who was looking at uh, sugar cane, and he was taken from sugar cane to your, your sugar bowl in London, right? And looking at, uh, at that time it was Tate and Lyle. Very interesting, very, very interesting study. I think proper of a, a school of architecture because he was saying this cane is very, it's brittle, it's, it can be damaged very badly from this to the first, um, the first stage of the refinement. Yeah? So from extraction to the refinery, there were very, very large lorries taking these things there. His first criticism was, wait a minute, why wasn't that very simple first uh, refinement done on site? because then what happens is that the local people will, will benefit from that. So the procurement is something which is extremely important, from, from, from extraction to, to installation, right? This is what I meant before, that we acquire this special knowledge which helps us to be discerning. Why do I not want this material, right? Well, because I know what it takes to bring it here. Second, second step, uh, the most suitable. Yeah, my difficulty with this word it on you, but I think it's quite important. And it's a question of knowing the stage of, or, or if you want, the state of the art in each field. So what's happening today regarding electrical storage, right? Very, very important. I mean, it's not just making my building uh, self-sufficient in terms of electricity, so I can actually do this, that, and the other. But storage is extremely important. What's the state of the art in there? What's happening there? Well, the same thing with concrete, the same thing with any other material that we're looking at. What is the state of the art? And then step three is really launching in this alternative thinking, this alternative uh, really is not simply transposing one for the other. You know, you get ridiculous things. You go to Port Marion, and the, in the harbor, you've got a concrete ship there moored. It's never, you know, it, it's not that. It's not a tra the simple transposing of one material with the other. No, it's actually getting it right. So this is what I think, and this is the real lead that we can take in industry, all right? Very, very often in the last 60 years, um, architects are actually been choosing from the shelf. This is absolutely not acceptable, yeah? Oh, I'll have one of those in green and one of those in red. And then you put them in here, and is that architecture? No, we've got to su subject that action to a rational way of looking. Is this the best material for this? Is this the best use? So step three is really embarking in this journey of, let's call it transmaterialization, you know, which is long enough to get it wrong. So, you know, perhaps that's the, 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 the third uh, thing, including the necessity for that. And I think we have in the, in the TS team, uh, ETS team, uh, someone who's actually had the guts to confront the largest owner, or the owner of the largest amount of square footage in London, in the city of London. And he said, you're doing it wrong, you know? Uh, fortunately, the guy didn't react very badly, and he said, well, we must talk about it. And they've been talking about it, how they can actually make the same profits and yet get the, uh, the, 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 right, uh, the right end. 
sometimes it's a question of, you know, I need a new garage because I bought myself a, a car which is too big for it, you know? Uh, and sometimes it's just one thing leads to another. We really got to be discerning enough to say enough is enough, that is it, yeah? Okay, um, so from here we know it would be good to, to go quickly through a few uh, materials so that we actually have a different chip in our head, yeah? So if you take, we've seen concrete there, well, concrete looks, yeah, it sometimes is not the right thing. Here I'll have to say most, most contractors, small, medium and big, look at, contract, uh, at concrete as the easy way out. You ask them to do this, that, and I say, ah, leave it with us, we'll get it. When they say leave it with us, to me, he says, uh-uh, what are they going to do? Because very, very often you go, plop, plop, the whole thing is full of concrete, and off you go. And this, you know, it's not the way to go about it. We really need, be, need to be discerning. But concrete or, or so I think the, the concrete is important to actually get the, the, the structure up. But we're talking enough about concrete. So if we go to steel, for example, I think that... Um, I think that what we have, we need here, is the emergence of a new aesthetics. That is to say, we have to see that there, in the past there have been moments. See, it's beautiful to see a history of art and history of architecture in, in this respect. You know, that the aesthetics come from an understanding of what we're actually doing holistically, right? And I think we've got to move into a new aesthetics. I like this very much, you know, discovery roads were all very nice and I think that, you know, we've all gone there to see them in the flesh uh, and, you know, they're a bit of a monument, but we mustn't forget what they are, bottom right, yeah, a chunk of steel there, was it necessary, right, so I think this new aesthetics is to learn how to make something which is beautiful and doesn't have to be so special that then it's of no use to anybody else. Why? Because this is extremely, uh, extremely expensive in terms of, of energy, in terms of cost, in terms of everything. So don't just d demolish the pyramids, but don't make new ones, okay? This is more or less the, the, the message here. Yeah? The bottom right, um, I heard a comment, I, don't I hope it's not right, but I heard a comment that these ones are the ones that went wrong and were not used. So imagine, yeah? I hope it's not right, as it's not correct. So, um, we need, uh, with wood there is an awful lot, we've talked about with the spectacles, there is, wood loves certain companions, it has its love mates, it has its way of uh, helping wood to go where wood cannot go. That's, you know, the message here. So if you're thinking of, of wood, uh, look, not everything, we've got in, 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 in Galician, we've got a, a, a saying, you know, na casa do ferreiro con telo de palo. You know, sort of uh, in the house of the has, ha, um, blacksmith is where you find the wooden knife, you know, i.e. the wooden knife doesn't work. Yeah? So basically what we have to do here is that wood, to know wood very well in, in what it can offer, the best uses of it and its limitations, and then find soulmates that can actually come and, and help wood there. Clay, well, um, <clears throat> like, clay is probably my, my, my favorite in many ways, particularly when you actually start reinforcing the ceramics and it becomes a very, very, very interesting uh, combination or composite. But I would say um, sometimes it's exactly the wrong thing. I remember with Alejandro La Sota in, uh, uh, here in London when I invited him to speak in this room, and he was leaning over in the, uh, a, a very special building, uh, which he wanted to see. And uh, so I took him there and he says, he didn't want an answer, but he said, Javier, was it all necessary? Knowing his work, you know, there's lots of things that are not necessary. I think uh, of all the things that uh, P. Vittoria has written, for me the most beautiful one is, uh, uh, is uh, that little booklet, you know, that, um, which I think is, is you know, I don't know if all of you have read it, but it's the one that says less is enough. And I think there's a very beautiful way of actually saying, you know, what is appropriate or not. Ceramic tiles. I mean, if we're putting a floor for, I don't know, a tank uh, showroom or a lorry showroom, I understand that you would actually want the ferro tile. But to know that you're putting in your bathroom a tile that has to be 
uh, killed at a thousand degrees centigrade so that nothing breaks it. So well, I don't know what you're going to have in your bathroom that could break it. So there is a level there. But a thousand degrees centigrade to produce ceramics is something that I question, right? Stone. Well, I think stone is, is, is something that which is absolutely fantastic, but please think of reusing stone. Yeah? I mean, this is what has been done in history. We've forgotten about it. But look at the Colosseum, right? Where is that stone? So I think glass is... Um, uh, my comment on discernment is very, very important. Uh, I think that architects tend to have in their lifespan a moment when they have an infatuation with glass, they fall in love with glass, they do things in glass, that really, Alejandro Lasota says, was all this necessary? And I think we have to be sensible on that. Also, we have to sense that if we're looking for the new aesthetics, we are not going to miss that impressive meeting of the glass to glass, which we've all done it, you know, at least I've done it, you know, and, you know, uh, is this necessary? Is this the best way to actually uh, articulate the, the thoughts, the, the ambitions that you got? Remember that I defined, or at least in TS, we defined um, architecture or design as a materialization of an idea, okay? So there are many, many ways in which you can do that, but certainly, um, Let's beware with, with glass of this infatuation that can come because it's a wonderful um, product. Discernment, discernment. There's a horses for courses, there's a glass for each use, yeah? And, you know, I had a, a client, and this is a gospel truth, a client who said, no, no, I want bulletproof glass in the, in the windows of my house. And so I, you know, said, well, in that case, we'll do it this way, this way, this way. I said, no, 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 in both directions. <laughs> I said, no. it was very funny, you know, so in both directions, outside in and inside out. So, um, anyway, don't, um, fine, I'll leave it at that. I could <laughs> joke about it, but um, plastics, I think from now on means that we need to stand firm. We need to know. Without discernment, we are not going to help anybody. But knowing the source of this plastic and that, and what is the problem, and knowing alternatives is what we need to have here. And I think that, uh, look, the bottom line of this, I'll make it very short because I think we, we need to, to hurry up. We can help very many good courses in plastics. And we can take the baddies to bankrupt and support the goodies, because there are many, many plastics that are very, very well thought out and very responsible, and many others that are not. Composites, well, um, I think that your TS3 and TS5 is mostly about it, but anyway, we'll leave it at that. I think that we have to start from a, this thinking is to start from a schedule of, or performance schedule and then see how I can achieve that. Um, light, I think, light is my, my, my passion. I think that you're right, you know, my specialities are the ones that you've uh, uh, mentioned there in my CV, but in the, my fifth year in the, in the TS, I fell in love with, a, with light, and I think light is a, it's a building material, and you can actually tell uh, what is natural light or not, and sometimes it's a question of making a hole in the fabric, and then bring the light in, and you can, I have seen that, right? Six floors, and you can bring the light, send it to light, six floors to the sub-basement. Okay, but one thing that we should be very, very aware, we are in this country guilty of what you see on the screen, okay? The black pill il illuminations that we are so proud of, this we've sold to the rest of the world. And very many of these are not, simply not necessary. But there are occasions. Now, do we not need to be blowing candles as we do in our birthday all day long? No. So there's a moment for each thing, you see? So illuminating something, wonderful, fantastic. But is this the way we have to live? Because, you know, when you want to look at the stars, you can't because there's so much light around you. So I think light is something that um, is a building material. But I think I'd like to, to, to suggest that we learn from nature, you know, as far as light is concerned. You know, what happens in daylight, what happens outside daylight, and so on. Now, briefly going to, um, I think, uh, I think I could skip all this, can't I? Um, well, um, right, yes, let's skip that, and it goes directly to, to, to water, because I think that, 
Water is a building material as well, all right? And it has its fascinations and all that. But um, it's beautiful to see that um, I, I lived in London when um, Claude uh, Allaire and people like that started to say that um, that the water that we see in the rivers and the seas and so on uh, is not... Uh, you know, our water, in the sense that up to then, scientists have actually thought that with the amount of hydrogen and the amount of oxygen that we got here, we'll never run out of water. But the isotopes of hydrogen and, and, and oxygen that we have in, on Earth are not those of the isotopes that you see in, in the sea, etc. So what's happening here is that at some stage, meteorites are mostly ice, right? At some stage, that water came from there. But the Earth is so beautifully balanced in the sense that is warm enough, it has a hot center, a core, is warm enough, it's heavy enough to have a very powerful gravitational force. So water could not come out. And it starts growing, and this is the beauty of water. We're going to understand that it's not that it's formless, no, it's that it has its own path of least resistance, and it goes, and that is what actually happens in water. So this is going to, we're going to come back to that. But I do remember very, very well, um, the man behind this hydroelectric things will happen to be a great uncle of mine. And as a nine-year-old, when this one was open, I was there, you know, and I heard this, he said, well, we are supplying electricity to the northwest of Spain, to the north of Spain, and some parts of the south of, uh, of France. And I said, wow, he's my hero, all right? It's fantastic. Look what they're doing and so on. And the place is really impressive, you know? When you're down there, and this thing is a barrel vault in both directions, you know, so it's really strong. And, uh, but now, I don't think that that's the right idea. I think that locally, you can actually produce electricity locally, let the south of France have its lie, the north of France, the west, and then each one of them. Why? Because the reality is that you're actually doing things. Nature is going to cover these things. We know that. In 20 years' time, you won't see any of this, but it will be there. Right? And there are silos of concrete that you're doing nothing, they're in the wrong place. Yeah? So um, you can actually use the, the, the very wall as a silo, by the way. Uh, so, but it's a different way of thinking. Right? So, but this is the reality, okay? That we now have very much improved generators that don't need that potential height. Yeah? So what do we do with that chunk of water? This is something that I think we have to be aware of. Because to get uh, on the right-hand side, those green things, that's been dry for a long time. And that's not bothered the, the, the hydroelectric uh, plant. But we have to be there to actually recover that. So we need to know, which this is a, perhaps is a good point to, to, to talk about something else, which is where we, and with that we could start uh, winding up, which is um, our relationship with, with nature, right? I think you said very well there that my view is that uh, to work with nature is not enough. That we have to be aware that we are nature. We are the rational part of nature. And um, there was, just to give you an example, there was a, a very interesting um, video I saw of um, this number of mammals and marsupials in Australia that were very uh, danger of extinction, they've come to the limit, because they, there is a, a toad which got very poisonous skin, right? And they were just trying to eat it, and dead, you know, one after another. So this um, uh, guys came along and they took the toad to extract some of the venom, put it on a meat, a piece of meat, and then captured, you know, pairs of, uh, of, of these marsupials and these mammals and one reptile as well. And then they, uh, they gave them that to eat. And of course, they were sick as a parrot and, you know, uh, but they were, the dose was minimal and they survived it. The next generation, and they breathe three times a year, the next generation, when they came anywhere near the toad, they just ran like anything. And in that way, they managed to reestablish things. We are the rational part of it. So in our infrastructure, in our construction, in everything we tackle, there is an aspect in which we say, how does nature work? Because we are part of that nature. And this is very important when we try to put things right. So yes, the firm that um, has left you know, in, in middle Africa 
a, um, a, a scar 62 kilometers long and 12 meters wide uh, is reportedly now gone bust. <laughs> Can you imagine after having that extraction? to go bust, it's very difficult, but anyway, it's left it there. So you and I have to know what to do in, in circumstances like that and in our own projects. So just to, as an example with this, we can start, we're finished now. Uh, we were very proud in this country of this shipyard, you know? Most of the landmarks were done there, you know? And it really is a fantastic industry, okay? But then we see that this is where they all end up, okay? And my point is this, is that this is, this is 21st century, right? But it doesn't look it, does it? So this is just not acceptable in my, my dictionary because they are being killed, you know? Lots and lots of fatalities. These people are actually hanging from a rope and cutting a bit of steel and then the whole thing is coming down. These guys are running, <laughs> but you know, they, they are the ones who survived. Now, um, if the tools for assembly are the same tools as this assembly, why couldn't we actually, instead of closing these um, shipyards, why couldn't we actually start doing this here in a safe manner? And then I'm sure that if you uh, disassemble a ship in there, you'll have enough material for the next ship. So out of those three, could, two could actually be disassembling things and salvaging things, and the, the others could actually be building others. So I, I really you know, question some of these decisions. Now, it's not a question of just saying it, it's a question of knowing, because you have to operate from a, uh, from a position of knowledge. So just to, to, to recap a bit, I mean, it's a bit like a football team, right? Some of you, I mean, this is my urgency is that I won't be here in 2050, but you will, right? Now, some of you will be the strikers. You will be the ones that are actually thinking of that solution that actually does revolutionize in its own way uh, many of the things. You know, that happy marriage of the new material or the old material with a new form, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, And some of us would maybe, you know, the rest, midfielders doing a lot of work, defense, you know, good line there, safe pair of hands on the goalkeeper, all these things. But I think all of us, we have to have this, this idea. Here, between year one and year in year five, I think it would be very good if we actually consider that this, yes, um, I have to be looking for a breakthrough. And then I would say, please, make that break breakthrough very beautiful, because if it is beautiful, people will buy it. If it's something that is difficult to live with, I'm contemporary of Sue Ross, uh, Ralph, now. Well, she had to get up at three o'clock in the morning in her house to light the, the, the fire, so as to be, you know, what she called balanced. <laughs> well, I think that no one is gonna buy that kind of alternative, yeah? Yes, we are actually, we say we have the medicine. I'm convinced that we do have the, the technology, but um, the medicine goes with a certain diet. And we, this is what we have to be clear, you know, there's a, it's change of life that we actually, or change of style of life that we are proposing. Um, so I think we'll leave it at that, shall we? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javier. Um, if anyone has a question or a comment about what Javier told us and gave us a new perspective on, then go ahead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Roots are even better, then we can finish on time. Assembling and disassembling. The word? Thing? Assembling and disassembling. And I just want to ask you for um, a good book that you could recommend. On that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to shock you on that. D is it working? I am. Yeah, I'm going to, sh I'm going to shock you on that because uh, at the moment my my answer to all of you here is that that book has to be written, probably by you. Okay. Because uh, this is precisely the core of my of my uh, talk. 
that um, we have to find that information, okay? There's a shortcut. I can actually point out a few things later on. But um, it, it's the, the chip has got to change here that I have to find the alternative. Uh, in my office, it's very funny because if I want to find something in the internet, I don't do it myself. I ask somebody else. Um, my sister told me that her children, I told her that, no, mum, this is for you, that, that is for us, you know? The, the, the actual command for the television was very simple, on, off, volume, you know? The other one was very complicated, you see? Uh, each one of us is the generation. You have to, to, to have this. Why? And uh, this is not a cop-out. Is that when you're looking for something, you're refining your search, yeah? You're actually starting to be discerning. So straight away, you press all, you press images, you press all again, and then you start to see that none of this is of any interest, right? So that's, that's the sort of research. But yes, later on, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where, yeah? Thank you, Javier. <laughs> very head clearing, very nice. Um, I, I like the way you started very much and when you talked about architects and others actually going through a checklist and, and giving the impression and in fact actually going, you know, approaching issues from behind and always, in a way, catching up with things. And I mean, my view is that it has had a, a, a very particular effect on architecture. Um, which people usually call sustainable architecture or green architecture, and that, I mean, it, it is aesthetically and in most other ways very unsatisfactory. And I think this is one of the reasons why schools of architecture, understandably, have a rather little time for those fundamental issues, which is how we as architects might actually you know, relate to the natural world in a responsible fashion, as you put it. And um, I wonder, you know, how one might actually get to that bigger picture which you have into that. Yeah. And, and how, you know, architects might actually be both interested and knowledgeable about the natural world, and I think we are we are only at the beginning of this. That's right. Yeah. Um, and in, uh, people still operate at a rather knee-jerk level. For instance, Grafton architects, who are quite good architects, uh, they have that frame. Yeah. But uh, you know, now they are in the process of changing the materials they use and getting everybody to learn about how to work with steam versus that they don't use concrete. Mm -hmm. Now, I would describe this as a knee-jerk reaction because yeah. nobody has really thought mm -hmm. at some length, and I think at the end convincingly about the relationship between, say, this big picture and what it means to build with timber, which is actually usually the CLT. Yeah. And I wonder whether you have yourself some yes. suggestions about how one might get to the bigger picture. Yeah, very much so. <clears throat> I think that, yes, the earliest uh, attempts to be sustainable, in inverted commas, that you referred to at that period, um, the... Um, their target was to be sustainable full stop at whatever cost, as it were. And I think that most of them will accept that, you know, that's what they were doing and without actually trying to make it beautiful. We have a big tradition of ornament and not ornament, etc., 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 right? But I think that um, this is what I was saying, that it's not that the previous generations were worse. They were not, we are not better than them, but we now are aware, and therefore we have to make it beautiful. And this is what I was saying right at the end. Please make it beautiful, because then we've solved the problem. If it is not beautiful, we may not have solved the problem. I think that this is happening, and I can say that uh, we're only halfway through the year, but I can see that the, the a num quite a number of, probably the majority of the ETS-5 projects that are going on that are very, very aware of this, and uh, I think they're going to be beautiful as well as being uh, rational and 
and responsible. So I think that we have started, I think, yeah? And we have the, 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 the answers. Um, even in, well, I was going to say even in the AA, especially in the AA, yeah, you have to wade through opinions of everybody, including your, your, your unit masters and all the others, you know, I include you know, my team in it. But I think that ultimately uh, each student is very much aware that they are sitting in the driving seat and thank you, thank you for that, but I'm going to do this. So I think that I'm seeing already, you know, a, a very clear conscience that this is what we've got to do and that no less first than ever before for beautiful uh, answers and solutions. I wish the school did more architecture. That is what I, because I think that this is ultimately the, the, the litmus test is in what we build. And I think that that's what I would like to see more of it. But anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so, hi. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Um, hi, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, when you were talking about light, um, it was a little bit, you cut it short a little bit, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering because, so you talked about maybe asking, first question being, do we really have to live this way where everything, I know, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, like, did you mean, when everything's constantly lit up, or what are some of the things that, some of the thoughts that you have about sustainability yeah. in relation to light? Yeah. Um, no, what I mean, is three, three headings here. One is, yes, uh, do we need to live this, uh, our life this way, yeah? Um, because, you know, um, there are situations in which we are just simply spendthrifts, you know, you're putting things. Uh, this room, well, it's not as bad as a, as a uh, barrel ball, but I can challenge all of you that at any one stage, there are two or three more lamps when the light, when the sun goes down, hitting directly your retina, you know, so it's very, very awkward room, but throughout. So that's one side. But no, um, light is indeed a, um, a building material, okay? And uh, it, it contributes to our well-being as much as any other um, uh, material, uh, but much, much more. And I think that light never short changes you. You try to bring light into a room and pay attention to how you're bringing it and so on and so forth. And it always, the, the result is always much more beautiful. So, and then the third one is that we tend to replicate what we see uh, in daylight uh, at night. And I think that has to be questioned as well. Because to replicate, you're never going to do it to start with, but to replicate uh, daylight artificially is a non-starter for me, yeah? It's night, so we look at it differently, and therefore we don't have to re reach the, the lumens and that, 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 that natural light gives us. So I think that that's part of it, yeah? It's an interesting book on sleep, you know, it tells you that use a torch and turn the lights on if you want to go back to bed. For all the people, this is quite important, you know, when they have to break the night to go to the loo, uh, it's very important, you know, to use a torch, because when you go to bed, it takes five minutes to get back to sleep. If you have too much light, the body thinks that it's daytime. I don't know if it's true, but anyway, it was a nice idea. But definitely, as designers, uh, sometimes we try to emulate, you know, the, the natural light, and I think it's a non-starter, you know? Any more? Aren't you hungry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think there are three things to consider. One is problem solving, innovation, and invention. Three very, very different things, okay? 
um, they're mixed together in some ways, and sometimes we think that we're inventing something, which is simply problem solving. Innovation is doing the same thing, but in a better way, which is what we should do anyway. It's a kind of bottom line. So, oh, very innovative answer. No, no, that's what we should be doing. You know, that's, that is the bottom line. Uh, invention is, you know, you have to look at it. I, I think that there is a great lack of three-dimensional training in all schools. Yeah, as in this country, I can't tell for schools in other countries, but in all schools. And this affects our inventiveness because we are not able to even think through it three-dimensionally in that, in that respect. So I think that invention is seeing what nobody else has seen up to now, and in that, usually a physical phenomena and so on, actually bringing out you know, this new way of doing things that has never been done before. But at least we should be innovative in the sense that if we're going to be doing resolving the same problem in the same direction, it should be, you know, as never before, yeah? Okay. <laughs> All right, the gap is now more than 10 seconds. So this <laughs> right, well, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you.